On today's show, the bond between man and bird. Find out how Brother Gregory made an impact on Purple Martins that's heavenly. It's just amazing. And a close encounter with a colorful bloom inspired a Minnesota woman to go wild about wildflowers. There's another rite of passage when spring comes to Minnesota. It's a sight to behold, the dance of the prairie chicken. And our Minnesota Bound Classic this week, don't forget the little butterfly that could up close and personal with the life and times of the monarch butterfly. Minnesota Bound. Brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC Dealers. Hi everybody, Raven and I welcome you to the show. You know, about this time of year, Purple Martins return to Minnesota. They are also returning to St. John's Abbey. Why? Well, you could say it's a heavenly story. They seem to be coming in a little bit more now. Was this the busiest time of their, uh, their life? Under the watchful eye of Father Gregory Ivensteiner, pairs of purple martins grace the sky. Oh yes, yes. They're feeding, yes. Yeah, they're coming in quite regularly. Purple martins cavorting over the campus of St. John's University may not appear to be a divine moment. On the other hand, you could say Father Gregory has been praying for this moment for years. <laughs> I don't think it's gotten to that yet. <laughs> Brother Gregory is a monk here at St. John's Abbey, and Brother Gregory is also a nature enthusiast, and he loves Purple Martins. And so Brother Gregory, uh, many years ago, was determined to get a Purple Martin colony started here at St. John's. Divine intervention may have been necessary. Once a common summer sight around Minnesota's miles of lakeshore, the bird has become the proverbial Minnesota canary, declining nearly 80% in the last 40 years. The thing that intrigued me about them was that you really have a bird that's yours. Uh, you can, you know, you can feed it if you want to, but you don't have to. You don't have to worry about if you go someplace that, bed, that the birds are being watered and fed. All that takes care of itself. And yet you can go there any time and, and enjoy them. Enjoy them, he does. Today, though suffering from Parkinson's disease, Brother Gregory continues to marvel at the Martin Colony. I'm gonna lay down my burdens way down, down by the riverside. This is the Sagatagon. That's their, their favorite uh, nesting spot. Yeah, this is the ideal place. It's right along the lake. Right now, I, I, I can't do the cleaning of the houses anymore. That's why I got Jim and Dean and Gina. To, uh, to help me with that, or they do all the work. I just stand there and watch. <laughs> in early spring, before the Martins return from their winter home in Brazil, Jim Koenig readies the Martin houses. It makes it easy to do nest checks. Every week we do a, a census. We look and see how many nests there are, how many eggs there are, how many babies there are, and then we try to get an estimate for the Purple Martin Conservation Association of how many fledged. So we have some idea as to whether the population is recovering or not. A key to restoring the birds' numbers includes house designs that keep out predators, namely house sparrows and starlings. They attack Purple Martin nests, their eggs, and their young. In North America, um, the purple martins are the only bird that is entirely, 100% dependent on humans putting up their housing. They will not survive without human housing. One of the earliest martin houses, first used by Native Americans, was a gourd. 
it's a lot of work to, to grow gourds and haul them out and paint them and everything. And so the, the, the best way of doing it today is by buying one of this uh, gourd made out of poly. And this particular preformed gourd is only like about $12. This gourd is specially made for the long neck and it has a starling proof entrance on it so starlings can't get inside the gourd. And it prevents owls and other predators from reaching inside and grabbing the nestlings. The trick, of course, is to attract attention when the martins return. When they start nesting, and they're pretty well set. When they bring in the green leaves, yes. and they're ready for our nesting. Sounds easy if you have the right stuff, or maybe the right connections. These days, when spring arrives and the martins return to St. John's Abbey, the birds are apt to see a familiar sight. They come back every year to the same, to the same place. It's practically the same house, the same gourd that uh, that they moved into. So it's uh, so it, it just feels like you're you're part of their life too, you know. And so the cycle of life, as Purple Martins know it, plays once again at St. John's, a bit of God's natural world simply restored with a little faith. Oh, I love it. I love it. Up next, let's find out what's blooming as we hit the wildflower fields with the local Minnesotan who made her mark with her own wildflower field guide. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC dealers. Connecticut. Tracker Boats, and by Jesse Treble's Safe Basements of Minnesota. Welcome back. We're going from Purple Martins to Wildflowers. It's that time of year, right? Our next story is about a lady who was so enamored with wildflowers. Well, we call her the Wildflower Lady. This place has been restored, and this is what it used to look like 100 years ago, 150 years ago. It's just amazing. Katie Chaika spends many days walking open meadows, but it's what she knows about those places that might surprise you. Here we've got some St. John's wort. This is a, a native spirea bone set. Down here, this little pink thing down here, I don't know if you can see that, that's an agalinus. It started out back in about 2005. This is obedient plant. I started walking around the neighborhood. Just this purple wildflower just caught my attention and I said, what a pretty flower, I wonder what it is. From there, I just took my digital camera, my cheap little Kodak, and took it down the park and started photographing all the different wildflowers I could find and tried to ID them. And that was where it come into a bunch of brick walls because there was so few reference material for things that are specific to Minnesota. Struggling to find answers, Katie decided it was time for a change. I said, well, somebody's got to do it for Minnesota. It might as well be me. She began to research each flower and build a website to record her findings. Minnesotawildflowers.info. A website dedicated to Minnesota's wildflowers, particularly how to identify them. And it launched in March 2007 with about 15 species documented and photographed and everything ready to go at that time. 15 was enough to start. Within two years, she had listed 300 flowers. The Latin name, a common name, and if it goes by other common names, what family and genus it belongs to. We also have these maps that we started making to show exactly where in Minnesota you might find it out in the wild. The whole thing was designed to help people ID plants because I struggled with it so much myself. In 2009, Katie got a boost. She met Peter Juck, a man who shared her passion. We met on a field trip with the Native Plant Society. By the end of that year, he decided to jump on board the website. Peter brought with him 50,000 images. If you click on the enlargement, you get a little slideshow. So I had this large collection. 
50,000 images was a real big help. <laughs> it's really grown a lot since then. We've got better quality images. I got a better camera. He's taught me a few things about how to take outdoor images. People want to know. It fills a need. You know, what is this world we live in? And that's what botany is all about, what it's been always about. What is this world we live in? What are these things around us? Finding Minnesota's native wildflowers might not be easy, but thanks to Katie, naming them will. It's become more or less my life now. <laughs> Are these prairie chickens dancing in celebration? Find out their success story next. Closed captioning is brought to you by By The Yard. You know, in the springtime in Minnesota, when you mentioned dancing with the stars, you might be referring to prairie chickens and sharp-tailed grouse. My oh my, do they know how to dance. Dancing with the stars, nature's version. Sharp-tailed grouse at dawn. You're also watching a love story of sorts. Happens every springtime in northern Minnesota. Male versus male. Dancing and cooing and looking bold. All to catch the eye of a female. It's a courtship ritual as old as America's prairie landscape. You'll see them just facing off against each other and staring each other down, dancing in that little circle. You know, boy, if, you, if they cross over and, and leave their little spot and go into their neighbors, you'll get a little battle and a little pushing and shoving and, and chasing around. They're picking their spot and then the hens come in and they just sit at the side and watch and choose which, which male is, is you know, the, the best dancer, the best, the best mate for them. It amazes me how they can choreograph that and be so in tune with each other. They'll all be going and they will all stop and just freeze and pause for, you know, 20, 30 seconds, not no movement, and then they'll all just kick back on and, and start on again. For the sharp-tailed grouse, this is also a dance for survival. Once abundant in parts of Minnesota, sharp tails now are scarce, the victims of changing times and changing habitat. <laughs> on another morning, on the Blue Stem Prairie near Glendon, Minnesota, another dance with a different star, the prairie chicken. The prairie chickens, too, are dancing to a ritual as old as the birds and bees, males seeking females. Like the sharp-tailed grouse, the prairie chicken also fights for survival in Minnesota's changing landscape in farm country. Prairie chickens are a resident grassland bird that require large blocks of grassland habitat like we have here on the Blue Stem Prairie Complex. With roughly 200 booming males, we've got around four to 500 prairie chickens here in this 8,000 acre grassland complex. Minnesota's grouse challenges are simple. To keep them dancing, we must preserve the prairie. Using fire as a tool, the Nature Conservancy maintains their prairies for ideal grouse habitat. Unfortunately, most grassland birds have been in pretty steep decline in terms of their populations for decades. In Minnesota, only one-third of one percent of the original 18 million acres of prairie remains. The good news is, when spring returns to Minnesota, the dance still goes on. Sharp tails and furry chickens. 
the whole goal of these male prairie chickens on this booming ground is to be noticed. And to be noticed means you get pretty flamboyant. And beginning in April, you can be a witness. This is open to the public. It's uh, by reservation so that we can manage the, the public use of these blinds. And it's simply a matter of calling the Nature Conservancy's Blue Stem Prairie office. Reservations are free. The only charge is a sense of hope. Simply hope you're not watching The Last Dance. Coming up, a little monarch magic for the spring season. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Grand Rapids Tourism, Beano in the Valley, and by Open Air Solutions. Time now for our Minnesota Bound Classic. You know, monarch butterflies have been in the news lately, and the news is not good. But our story is a celebration of this very special flying insect. Oh, I missed it! Hunting for the king of butterflies. <music> of all the miracles of nature, the most common of them all, backyard version of Believe It or Not, may be the erratic autumn flight of the monarch butterfly. Got it. Good job. Best way is to, to get it out is to hold all four of its wings together. With a monarch in hand, naturalist Valerie Queering of the Richardson Nature Center is performing a rather miraculous procedure of her own, banding a bug. The tag this butterfly is going to get is JHM626. Now we have a tag butterfly about to attempt a rather unbelievable feat. So when we let this go, this is one that will attempt to migrate to Mexico. Uh, if it makes it there, somebody will possibly find the tag and they'll know that we tag this butterfly um, on September 5th in Bloomington, Minnesota. Yes, migrate to Mexico. Not all monarchs do it, but millions try. This is the generation of monarchs that are heading to Mexico. The other um, populations that we've had uh, have just laid their eggs, died, and it's the last generation that we have here in the summer that will migrate. Hope it gets to Mexico. Under a program called Monarch Watch, ah! got it, got it, got it, got it! Volunteer butterfly banders are merely ah! trying to help scientists answer age-old questions, like, how do the monarchs know where to fly to? These butterflies are going to fly to somewhere that they've never been before. They go to the same area to overwinter as generations before them, and they've never been there before. Got it. It wasn't until the 1975, I believe, that um, people that lived in North America discovered their overwintering areas in Mexico. The destination for these Minnesota-born monarchs is a volcanic mountain range four hours west of Mexico City a distance of roughly 1,800 miles. Travel time, two months at least. But for migrating monarchs, it's also a one-way trip. When they um, overwinter there, that, that population will live about um, eight months, and then they will um, head back and start the spring migration, and then they will land in Texas area, lay their eggs, and then die. So the cycle continues, a butterfly so common in so many places, yet so magnificent in so many ways. And to think it all begins in something called the pupa stage. When it came out, its wings were like wet paper, so it'll be a couple hours before it can fly. Fly away to Mexico, a monarch with no map, just another backyard miracle we can't explain. <laughs> a magical monarch. And by the way, coming up in a few weeks, we'll have another story about monarch butterflies that says what you can do to help monarchs. 
Well, that about does it for us. Remember, introduce a kid to the great outdoors. I'm Ron Sharon, of course, always the star of the show, who's a little antsy today, is Raven. Yeah, 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 yeah. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433. For more information on these stories and more, catch us on the web at mnbound.com.